All right, welcome to our latest video. Today's video is about infections and overgrowths and things that are really, really common in the functional world. But things like Lyme disease, things like Epstein-Barr virus or other viruses, uh, things like bacterial infections, and, and then how those combine or connect with things like mold or candida. And, and what we're going to show you is really a basic overview of the mechanisms of some of these things because when you understand the mechanisms if you in my opinion if you understand what we're going to talk about today then the solutions become kind of self-evident and I think that another thing with today is you know the reason that we record these longer videos is these are the things that we see commonly in functional medicine practice these are the things that we want our patients to be educated on um, and you can see that when you understand the mechanisms you can understand the connection and how one leads to another. So these things are really, really common. They're heavy topics. Today is a heavy, heavy PowerPoint presentation. And then another thing with these videos is, you know, they can educate and inform, especially for our existing patients, but to prospective patients, they educate and they inform, but the takeaway is that you need to work with somebody, that you need some help, that you need some guidance, that there's a lot to these things. So we're gonna go over a lot of information uh, and the takeaway is, you know, we're going to end with some solutions, some of the possibilities, some of the potential solutions. But I think that the takeaway, too, is that you're going to need somebody to help you through a lot of this. Because there's lab testing, there's supplement protocols, there's, there's all this different stuff. But once again, what I want to explain is the mechanism. Because to me, when this kind of clicked, uh, the vicious cycle of infections and overgrowth lead to more infections, lead to more overgrowth, lead to more infections, lead to more overgrowth. When this clicked from an immune standpoint, from an immunological standpoint, it was like, oh, this all makes sense now. So that's my goal today. So let's just dive right into it. So this is a massive problem in, in functional medicine. You know, we see the people with with chronic fatigue and with anxiety and with bloating and with depression and with, you know, all the things. So we see this all the time uh, as a root cause in, in my practice. And it's not like the slide says, it's not that everyone has all of these problems, but when you understand the mechanism, it can explain why we keep seeing more inflammation, more autoimmune disease, more Lyme disease, more neurological disease, more digestive diseases, more inflammatory bowel disease, more, and then patients come in with more allergies, asthma, food sensitivities, and they'll say things like, boy, you know, I didn't have allergies growing up, but it all started five years ago, and, and it was, you know, barely noticeable, and then this year, you know, I can hardly breathe, um, and, and so they're kind of asking the correct question of like, boy, you know, I wasn't born with this, why do I all of a sudden have this disease or this condition? It, and this can cause crazy, crazy symptoms. You know, things like Lyme, I think things like viral reactivations, they cause crazy symptoms, which is a lot of the stuff that I see in my practice. You know, if it was as easy as like, hey, you just need to eat a little bit better and exercise a little bit more, those aren't the people coming into my practice. Uh, the people coming into my practice are the people who have the crazy symptoms. Um, and so I, I think that everyone, you know, especially here in the Midwest, has that one friend with Lyme who can't get out of bed and who's been to 15 or 20 doctors. Um, and like I said, that's, that's a lot of my practice. So a lot of the crazy symptoms include things like fatigue, things like anxiety, unexplained, you know, unexplained fatigue, like you're way more tired than you should be. Um, not just like you're a mom, you got a couple little kids at home, normal, normal fatigue, but unexplained fatigue, unexplained anxiety. You know, some of my patients will say, I'm sitting there in church and it just hits me. I'm sitting there watching TV and it just hits me. And it's almost like a panic attack or an anxiety attack. Something causes that. Something causes all these symptoms. Pain, uh, joint pain, muscle pain, neck pain, migratory pain is a hallmark symptom of Lyme, di Lyme disease. So sometimes even just the pain or sensitivity can be caused by this vicious cycle that we're going to talk about. Then there are neurological symptoms, headaches, brain fog, numbness or tingling, dizziness, um, inability to recall things, you know, all kinds of neuro symptoms. And then commonly these can cause uh, dysautonomia which means a dysfunction of your autonomic nervous system, <clears throat> which your autonomics 
control the things in your body that are typically thought of as, as automatic. Like what still happens while you're sleeping? You still breathe, your heart still beats, your body still regulates its temperature, uh, you still detox, you still digest, you know, you do some of these things that you don't have to think about. You don't have to be conscious for them. So we'll see dysautonomia where people will have crazy heart rate issues. Their, their heart rate will skyrocket to, you know, high, um, and, and then it will drop, or they'll have blood pressure imbalances, or they'll have temperature swings, and they think, oh, it's my hormones, and it may be, but still, what's causing it? And a lot of times, it's these infections or overgrowth, or kind of the combo of both, as you're going to see. So the first thing to understand with this is to understand you know, the bugs that are, that are in our body. So you've got bugs, get used to it. And I think that, you know, especially in today's climate, you know, we think of like, oh, there's this one virus that everybody's scared of and we're going to get this one virus and like, we got to be careful of this one virus. Like it's, uh, you know, this one, you know, burglar that's, that's you know, going to break into our house. But you've got a ton of bugs and you've got a ton of viruses and it's not about one virus that's a really short-sighted view, and it's not really even about one infection. So in your microbiome, the bacteria, especially the bacteria in your gut, you know, they used to think it was a little bit higher. Now they're saying right around 38 trillion organisms, microorganisms, bacteria specifically, 38 trillion uh, in your gut microbiome. They used to say it was more, now they're saying it's about a one-to-one -one with our, our human cells. But you have all these trillions and trillions of bugs of bacteria in your gut, in your mouth, on your skin, in your vagina, in all these different areas. You want all these bugs. The eye, they are really, 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 really important, really, really helpful, really, really useful. And quite frankly, they, they, they do more bad than good. You know, we tend to think of germs as bad, of like, oh, we got to kill the germs, we got to fight the virus, we got to take the antibiotic, uh, all these things. And the, really, for the ma majority of bugs, they're really, really good, they're really, really helpful, and we'd be worse off without them. Our, the virome is an interesting topic, you know, once again, considering the climate in 2020, but we have 380 trillion viruses inside of our bodies. And I think that that's the most important thing when you talk about, uh, uh, you know, the, the current climate again, you know, the, the popular virus right now, it's like one virus gets all the attention, but all the other things still matter. And if you have all these other viruses or you have overgrowths or things like that that we're going to talk about, it's going to make you more susceptible to get this one virus that everybody's talking about. So you have trillions and trillions, hundreds of trillions of viruses in your body at all times. It's a normal part of life. So you have to ask yourself, are the bugs the problem or is it the immune system? And I think that you can, judging by my tone, you can probably answer that question, but we're going to explain how you can't really have one without the other um, so it's not just put all your attention into kill, kill, kill the bugs, kill the bugs, kill the bugs, but really what do we need to do to strengthen our defenses and make sure that we're not susceptible to an infection or a reactivation or something like that. And you have to, once again, that word that I just said, we have to change the way that we think about an infection. For most of us, if you ask us about an infection, it's like, oh yeah, I got a cold, uh, it was there for, you know, a week and I took antibiotics and, and then it went away. And so the infection is gone. It's like something that comes and it goes, um, and which is, you know, which is very, very true. But what happens is that you, I put the bucket on there because your body has this bucket of infectious burden. And I took this quote from uh, the journal Trends in Immunology and it says, in many cases, this is talking about infections causing autoimmunity because infections are a common cause of autoimmunity. In many cases, it's not a single infection, but rather a burden of infections all the way from childhood that is responsible for the induction of autoimmunity. So when we talk about these infections and these viruses, 
we're gonna talk about some of them like Lyme or like Epstein-Barr or like cytomegalovirus. And it's not like, oh, we need this Lyme protocol. We need this Epstein-Barr protocol. We need this uh, cytomegalovirus protocol. It's no, we need to look at the burden as a whole and what is happening in the immune system that's allowing viral replication, that's allowing viral activation, that's allowing viral infection or bacterial. And that's really the connection here. That is the golden nugget that you're gonna take away today is what sets you up for this uh, filling of the bucket, filling with uh, your infectious burden. So infections, you know, and I'm skimming through this once again, and this stuff, you know, is, is really the foundation. We're just laying the framework here, but there are different types of infections, intracellular infections, meaning that like, the, you know, the bug has literally gotten inside the cell uh, versus extracellular infection, which is the bug, you know, can be outside of the cell and still be colonizing, can still be doing bad things, can still be causing damage. So some of your extracellular infections, these are like your, your uh, strep throat, um, your staph, some of these bacterial infections like E. coli, mycoplasma infections, because they're in the bloodstream typically. They're not in the cell, they're in the bloodstream or they're in tissue. And so these are also our, our overgrowths. And you know, this is a very, very brief definition, but it's gonna lay the, the framework again for once we get into some of these immunological concepts. Then the intracellular, the bugs that get inside the cell and can hijack some of the equipment and different things in the cell, provide themselves with a safe home where they're never really uh, eradicated. Uh, but these are things like all viruses. So Epstein-Barr virus, that EBV, you're gonna see that a couple times today, but the Epstein-Barr virus, it is the virus that causes mono, 90% of people in the world carry this virus, meaning that they have this virus in their body. 90% of people in the world. Um, so, you know, the majority of people in the world carry this virus, but like many viruses, it just lays there dormant. And if it stays dormant, no big deal. If it awakens, if it reactivates, then it can become a problem. It's like waking the sleeping giant. And it's, it's kind of, it's like a, um, and if you know anybody with cold sores, it's the same thing. It's actually a herpetic virus. It's a member of the herpes family, and, and so is uh, HSV 1 and 2. Uh, but, you know, you might know somebody that has cold sores, and they say, you know, I used to get them when I was younger. I haven't had one in a decade. Or you might know somebody else that's like, oh, my gosh, I've been so stressed this year. I've had six cold sores. And that virus is, is allowed to reactivate, and then it shows its, you know, rears its ugly head there. Uh, and then bacteria like Lyme disease are also intracellular. So intracellular infections, you know, tend to be some of the ones that, that really, you know, cause a lot of the problems because they can persist for a really, really long time. They can be really problematic and cause a lot of the crazy symptoms and things like that too. Now that's infections. And I say on here overgrowths as well because that's what we want to differentiate is an infection meaning something that gets into the cell, something that gets into the tissue, something that's, that's a little bit more temporary, but it, it kind of grows over time, and then the immune system kind of quenches it and, and gets it back under control. But it's a little bit different, but it's extracellular. But where I'm going with this is overgrowth is the next slide. And so overgrowth, and you can picture the, the difference is like, you know, this is something that is overgrowing on something. Like, like, you know, if you have mold in your house and you've ever seen, you know, black mold crawling up the walls, well, it's not in the wall, it's on the wall. And, and so that's what the overgrowths are. So there can be bacterial or they can be fungal or oftentimes it can be both. And these are often found in our hollow spaces. So in the gut where you have all these, you know, 38 trillion bacteria and all these viruses and different things in there, you can have an overgrowth or what's called dysbiosis, meaning an imbalance of good guys to bad guys. All of a sudden, we want that to be like, you know, 80, 20 good guys to bad guys. Well, all of a sudden it's like, okay, we're getting a few too many bad guys and not enough good guys. So we're getting an imbalance and more of an overgrowth. So things like candida, which is a yeast, 
SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There can be a variety of different bacteria, but it's bacteria, the bad pathogenic bacteria that have overgrown in the small intestine where they're not supposed to be. We want them more down in the large intestine. And this can cause a lot of problems like bloating, brain fog, anxiety, fatigue, um, or CFO, which is the same thing but fungal overgrowth. So maybe it's a candida infection uh, overgrowth rather in the small intestine. SIBO, SIFO, dysbiosis, these are overgrowth. And so that often means like an imbalance. So like if your garden is overgrown with weeds, it's just a matter of like your plant to weed ratio has gotten a little out of whack. You've got too many weeds, maybe not enough plants, or maybe just you have the same amount of plants, but just over the years, the weeds have gotten more and more and more and more to the point where you can't even tell where the plants are because it's overgrown with weeds. This is an overgrowth. So in the gut is very, very common. In the sinuses is very, very common. Sinusitis is a big deal. Uh, a lot of times that's fungal. There's a study done out of uh, Mayo Clinic that showed that 93% of chronic sinusitis had fungal overgrowth in their sinus cavities. So a lot of times these things can grow, they can hide under biofilms, which we're gonna talk about. And in, in this study from Mayo, some of the people, they hadn't been exposed to any mold or any fungus f since like the 70s, but they still showed, you know, 30 years later or however many years later, they still showed that they had this fungal overgrowth uh, after being exposed. Because you picture this you, a mold, you get exposed to it, you breathe it in, it makes its way into your sinuses, and then it can colonize and it can grow. And once it grows, it's like a weed. Maybe you have no weeds in your garden, and the wind blows some dandelion spores in, or whatever those are called, you know, that you blow on dandelions, blows some of those in. The next year, you've got some dandelions. The next year after that, you've got more dandelions, and more dandelions, and more and more, until all of a sudden it's overgrown. And that's the same way that it can happen in the gut. That's the same way that it can happen in the sinuses. Very common in, in the vagina as well, uh, yeast infections or bacterial vaginosis, overgrowth in hollow spaces, uh, also non-common in the lungs. And also, you know, pretty common on things like breast implants. That's actually really, really common. Uh, dental implants, hip replacements, or other surgical hardware. You know, if you've got a fresh knee, if you've got a fresh hip, it is not impossible for things to grow on these things. When they go in, they remove them or they look at them, they'll find these growths on the hardware. They'll find biofilms that they're hiding under. They'll find some of these things. So that is the difference in, in the definition of, and in, when I refer to infection, I'm typically, for me, I'm typically referring to the intracellular infections they get in the cells and, and you know, cause problems. When I refer to an overgrowth, I'm more commonly referring to the overgrowth in hollow spaces um, like candida, SIBO, SIFO, just generalized dysbiosis. Um, and it's important that we make that distinction because as we you know, continue talking, it, it's really, really important. And, and the point is that one leads to the other and it's a vicious cycle. So we're going to get to that here. Now, I've mentioned this word a couple times, but these overgrowths especially, they can hide under something called a biofilm. And biofilms are crazy, um, but they're also, it's not that crazy. It's just really smart. These bugs are smart. I mean, that's, that's the problem. That's the problem with, uh, you know, MRSA and these drug-resistant superbugs is that if we keep treating them with the same things, they eventually get smart. They find ways to evade it. They find ways to hide. They, they have defense mechanisms, all these different things because they don't want to die. They want to survive. Um, so biofilms, this is like, let's say you have, you know, four bad guys and they all are like, hey, we're all bad guys, but let's all hide under this, this blanket so that the cops can't find us, right? And so they all hide under this blanket. And maybe one of them's a murderer, maybe one of them's a bank robber, maybe one of them's a rapist, or you know, whatever the worst of the worst are. It doesn't matter. They can all hide under this blanket together because they all have the same intention. They all want to hide 
from the police. They all want to hide from the immune system. And so they'll create these biofilms. And while they're under the biofilms, these bacteria, these viruses, these yeast, they can communicate, they can talk, they can move, they can still live, they can still survive. So the biofilms are crazy. So bacteria, fungi, and other microorganisms can hide under something called a biofilm. They can even use things like heavy metals to build the biofilm around themselves. So biofilms are one of the reasons why, you know, maybe you take an antibiotic and it doesn't clear up your infection or your overgrowth or your symptoms don't go away. Maybe it, maybe it never even touched the bacteria you were trying to go over. Maybe you know you have a yeast overgrowth and you went to your conventional doctor and they said, oh yeah, take these antifungals and maybe it didn't help. Well, maybe the antifungal never even touched the fungus because the fungus is hiding under these biofilms. So there, we just can't have this presentation without mentioning biofilms because it's really, really important. And if you're in this space as a patient, if you have Lyme, if you have Candida, if you have SIBO, very, 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 very common things, if you have mold and, and you have maybe hit a plateau in your, in your treatment, then looking at biofilms might be an important next step. And sometimes you break those biofilms up and all of a sudden, like, you know, the, 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 the heavens part and it's like, okay, now we're making progress again. Um, and, and so, like I said down here, sometimes persistent infections or overgrowths need a biofilm buster. So very common in the Lyme world, in the mold world, in the Candida world. Parasites are another thing that, you know, are, 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 they don't fall in the infection space, I guess. They don't fall in the overgrowth space. They kind of fall into both, but they're, they're a category in and of themselves, too. Uh, they are a lot more common than people think a lot more common than people think. They are hard to test for. A lot of false negatives in the parasite testing world. Um, and sometimes they don't show up on tests. Like, like a lot of these bugs, they're, they're smart, they hide. They don't want to show up on tests. Um, so parasites are hard to test for. And what they do, and we're going to get into this, and that's kind of the purpose of this whole, this whole talk, but they lead to what's called an increased TH2 response which is more allergies, more sensitivities, more asthma, more inflammation in the gut, more inflammation in the sinuses, which also leads to a decrease in Th1 in viral reactivation or more infectious burden. And they can also do things like they can gunk up the gallbladder duct, the bile duct, and cause detox issues, cause you know backup in the liver and the gallbladder and in the bile, which is really, really, really important for, for gut health. And so a lot of these parasites can do that. And there's different types of parasites, uh, helminths. There are flukes, like liver flukes, um, common for that bile duct. Uh, there are worms, like hookworm, roundworm, pinworm, flatworm, tapeworm. Um, so a lot of different parasites. And, and once again, it's just an important part of this conversation. Now, before I go on to the next one, um, oh, actually, let me, let me go on. Um, so parasites can cause virus reactivation, and this is one of the mechanisms by which they do this. So a helminth worm infection, let's say you get an infection with, with a parasite, it activates the immune system in a certain way called a Th2 immune response. We're about to get into that pretty deeply. Parasites always activate a Th2 immune response. That Th2 immune response is going to release certain cytokines. And if you have this cell here, this is called a macrophage, and it has these herpes viruses in it, and they're latent, meaning they're just sitting there, they're chilling, they haven't been active for a while. Maybe you had mono as a kid, maybe you had chicken pox as a kid, maybe you had a cold sore a decade ago, but it's latent. Well, this immune activation that can come from parasites and stimulate this Th2 immune response can allow that latent herpes virus to turn on its replication pathways and can all of a sudden start replicating and start shedding and start, you know, reactivating. So that is a big deal and it also sets the groundwork for, for you know, everything that we're going to talk about with this Th2 is that anything, parasites being one, anything that stimulates Th2, boosts Th2, 
is going to lower TH1. And so this is a teeter-totter here that if we put one side up, the other side goes down. And what we're going to see is this vicious cycle is that more of this causes less of this, less of this causes more of this, more of this causes less of this. And then over, the, over time and over the years, things just continue, continue, continue. So before we go on to the next slide of, you know, how do you know, what are the lab tests, things like that, I just want to recap this. So there's a difference between infection and overgrowth, but those, those two terms are, are kind of used interchangeably. To me, I think of infection, and is for the context of this conversation, I think of infection as, as more of the intracellular, the things that get into the cells and, and you know, they're there, they're inside your cells. Whereas the overgrowths are more things in the hollow spaces, um, like candida, like even staph, staph or, or like strep more like it, but uh, you know, you get a sore throat that's a strep infection or something, that's still a hollow space and that's an extracellular infection. Now, going back to that bucket, your body is a bucket, your infectious burden is a bucket. And so the metaphor that I like to use for this, and, and I, you know, I, I borrowed this from uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Sam Yannick, um, and he says the infectious burden of the body is like the crime rate of a city. It's never zero. The goal's not really even for it to be zero. There's always some crime going on in a city like Chicago or New York or L.A. But what happens is when the crime rate, we want to keep it well controlled. If that crime rate starts getting out of control, if there start to be more gangs, if there start to be more violence, if there's a crime spree, if there's a robbery spree, if there's a, a murdering spree, you know, if there's mafia or whatever the case may be, the crime rate starts to get a little bit out of control and you've got to bring in extra defenses sometimes to get that back under control. But the goal of any city is just to keep that crime rate under control. The city never wants to have to bring in the National Guard or bring in more police or bring in SWAT or something like that. They only do that when they have to because the rate has gotten out of control. But on the same, in the same breath of air, the rate's never zero. The goal isn't really to eliminate all the bad guys because the bad guys, especially in our body, are really, really important. So we're never trying to completely eradicate all these bacteria or all these viruses. We need them, parasites too, we need them to a certain degree. We live in symbiosis with these things and everything's all gravy until things start getting out of control, until that crime rate starts going up 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 so how do you know how do you know if you have these things how do you know um because most of us have have some degree of these things how do you know if it's well controlled well you know symptoms are the most helpful so like i mentioned you know if somebody comes in with a dysautonomia if somebody comes in with uh boy my heart rate goes up to 190 every time i lay down I'm, my head is immediately going to like bugs, viruses, Lyme, heavy metals maybe, um, but something like that. And, and you know, granted, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to even say because there's so many other pieces of the puzzle. So the way that you know is through a good history, good history, good paperwork, good symptoms. I mean, with a trained practitioner, that is by far the most important. You're not going to solve this uh, through Google and you know, not every symptom out there is an Epstein-Barr reactivation. That's uh, both of those are very, very short-sighted. Um, but yeah, your symptoms can be the most helpful. Of you know, tell me about your symptoms, and you know, there are different symptoms that match up with different bugs, even with you know Lyme or some of the Lyme co-infections. You know, if somebody has a uh, has one swollen joint, I, I'm I'm thinking more Bartonella, and th if somebody has uh, I don't know, you know, burning heels, <laughs> uh, heel, like heel pain that burns. I'm thinking more, you know, Lyme co-infections. If somebody has, um, you know, anxiety, it could be any of these things. If somebody has inability to hold their urine along with some of these other things, I'm thinking more mold. But the point is, I don't want you to self-diagnose, you know, that's, that's something that I would honestly say that, like, even my first five years in practice, you know, you feel like you have a good idea of it. It's like when you get a bachelor's degree, you feel pretty smart until you go on and get a doctor. Then you're like, oh my gosh, I knew nothing. 
Um, and so at, work with a skilled practitioner. Work with somebody who's been through this a lot, who's got a pretty good idea. You know, I had the patient text me today. She said, I'm having XXX symptom. I Googled it. I, it you think that's my thyroid because she has Hashimoto's. And I said, no, that sounds like gallbladder to me. And she Googled that and she said, yeah, you're right. This does sound like gallbladder. I also had this, this, and this. Uh, that's why, and she said, uh, that's why I'm so glad to have you. I don't trust any other doctor. Uh, but symptoms are the most helpful. Questionnaires, things like that. We have mold questionnaires. We have Lyme questionnaires, things like that. We have TH1, TH2 questionnaires, all kinds of questionnaires. But looking at labs, looking at labs is obviously really important. It's something that we're big on. It's something that we do a lot. The most helpful test for this is the most basic test of them all. It is the CBC, the complete blood count, with a differential. Without a differential, it's worthless. With a differential, it's really, really important. I didn't put that on there because I never order a CBC without a differential. Whenever I see one from the hospital or something, I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. These cheapskates, you know, it costs, it costs me like less than $5 to run a CBC. It's gotta cost the hospital like $2. And sometimes they'll leave off the differential and that's just a cost thing. But looking at things like total white blood cell count, if white blood cells are elevated, it's a sign of an active infection. If white blood cells are depressed, it's a sign of a chronic infection. Neutrophils and lymphocytes. So neutrophils uh, should be higher than lymphocytes. And if they flip-flop, it's a sign of a viral infection. The lymphocytes do more of the viral uh, fighting, whereas neutrophils fight more of the bacteria, more of the innate immune system, kind of first line of defense type of thing. Um, and so you can see that in the CBC. And sometimes I'll see people's labs, and I'll, I always say, you know, I never, hey, you have a virus, but I'll tell them right away, hey, here's what I suspect. Let's look at your viral titers. Let's look at your viral load because your lymphocytes are starting to outnumber your neutrophils. We're starting to see this shift in your immune system or your eosinophils. If we see high eosinophils, it's a guarantee that you're TH2 dominant, um, which is, you know, a big deal and tells us a lot, tells us a heck of a lot. There are other things, you know, like uh, TGF-beta, C-reactive protein, you know, different things that can tell us, you know, info about your inflammatory process and your mechanisms and stuff. A TNB lymphocyte, uh, natural killer cell panel, you know, that's an expensive one. Um, but there's all kinds of labs for, for immunology. Uh, how about a stool test, you know, to see if you have things like parasites or overgrowths or undergrowths of good bacteria. Stool testing can be really, really helpful for bacterial things. Now, sometimes we're talking about an infection in the gut might be different than an infection in the bloodstream or in the cells, uh, because if it's in the gut, it's contained and it's never really gotten into the bloodstream, but it's just more in the digestive tract, the hollow tube from mouth to anus, and that's a, that's a different thing, but a stool test can be helpful. An organic acids test. Uh, we'll run an organic acids test a lot if we're looking for things like mold exposure or um, yeast or candida or fungal overgrowth. Uh, you can get a lot of information or even some bacterial metabolites for things like Clostridium species or C. diff. Uh, you can get a lot of info from an organic acids test. Or there's a panel that I'll show here in a second called a Cyrex Array 12. Um, it's, a, it's a total pathogen panel, so it looks at a number of pathogens uh, in, in one place. That's a great idea. Or looking at even just the typical antibodies or the antibody titers. So looking at specific viruses like Epstein-Barr virus, um, looking for things like reactivation, looking at all the different antibodies that are part of that, looking at other herpetic viruses like CMV is cytomegalovirus, HSV is herpes simplex virus. HHV is just human herpes viruses. These are all HHVs, HHV1, HHV2, HHV4, HHV6. Um, I think that EBV is HHV4. I'm pretty, pretty confident on that. Um, shingles, you know, Coxsackie virus is a herpetic thing. So sometimes if you get shingles, I don't really need to do a lab test to tell you that you got viral problems you know you got viral problems, you get shingles. Um, but are there things that we can do to look at in the labs and use as pre and post? Absolutely. Uh, things like H. pylori, there's a variety of tests for that. There's a breath test, there's stool test. It's 
commonly missed on the stool test. There's a blood test too to see if it's systemic or see if you have what's called uh, IgG antibodies to, to H. pylori. Um, and then there's a lot of testing for Lyme. You know, Lyme is just, you know, vicious and bad. And so there's um, what's called a Western blot. There's also just a Lyme uh, antibody, Lyme IgG. Um, then there's also some advanced labs like Igenix, uh, who's just like basically a, a Western blot on steroids, um, different bands of the Lyme and different proteins of Borrelia and different Lyme subspecies and different things that are possible to see with Lyme uh, disease. So there's a ton of that. Now, the Western blot, just a quick mention, you know, the medical system has a two-step process. It's like if you fail step one, then we'll do step two. And, and you know, to me, I'm not, my hands aren't tied by insurance reimbursements. That sounds dumb to me. Why not just skip step one and just do step two? It costs 50 bucks. So we do a Western blot all the time. Um, so that, that makes a lot more sense to me. And, and here's a couple of examples. So here's somebody, this is the same person. Actually, it's two different screenshots, but it's the same person. And so here's what happened too is uh, based on her lab, like her hospital labs, you know, she had some crazy stuff. And so she got checked into the hospital. She had some labs. She brought it to me and said, oh, look at this neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. I'm concerned you have a virus or have high viral load. Because a virus, that sounds dumb. We have 380 trillion viruses in our body. If you un when you understand that concept, somebody says, oh, I think you have a virus. Well, duh, I, I got a bunch of them. But I think you have an a, a increased viral load, let's say. So let's see, cytomegalovirus. Um, so positive is anything over 0.69. You can see that she is over 10, and that's where the lab cuts off at. So huge, 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 um, at least 10 times, almost 20 times the high end of the antibodies here. So it, it's just a sign that she has increased viral load of this virus. Then here's the Epstein-Barr, and what's not on here is what's called the early antigen, which is how you usually tell with reactivation, but once again, just look at the ranges. Positive, so you, let's say you had mono as a kid, you might have positive antibodies still. Doesn't mean that you have any reactivation, and actually the early antigen is the most helpful for that, but so positive is anything above 21, she's above 600. So 30 times that upper limit, and it cuts off at 600, so maybe more than that. How about this one, positive once again, above 21.9. And anything that equivocal is 18 to 21, so it's like a pretty tight range. 18 to 21 is like, eh, maybe. Anything above 21, yeah, for sure. So above 21, positive, she's at 600. So very, very high viral burden in this patient. Now, do I think it's just EBV and just CMV? Absolutely not. There's probably a plethora of others that we're not going to test because this gives us an idea, it gives us a baseline, it gives us a target to aim at, it gives us a little bit of an understanding of some of the mechanisms. So this is, you know, it's just some of those basic serum testing. This is the Cyrex test. I just put one example in here, but you can see, you know, green, 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 green. Uh, and what this test for, there are different uh, oral pathogens, pathogens in the mouth. H. pylori, um, most common cause of, of ulcers, most, uh, most common infection in the world. Um, Campylobacter jejuni, this is uh, food poisoning. Yersinia is a common cause of Graves' disease, a uh, cross-reactor with Graves' disease. Uh, C. diff, candida, rotavirus, uh, entamoeba, giardia. So a lot of these, giardia is a parasite, but a lot of these are gut. You know, we went from mouth to more gut infections, Giardia. Cryptosporidium, so that's the first positive that we see. That's a parasite, that's a GI parasite that burrows into the walls of the small intestine. Um, so high reactivity to crypto, so a parasitic problem in this patient. Um, blastocystis, this is a human chlamydia heat shock protein. This is Acinetobacter, which is a bacteria that can cause sinus infections. And this patient had a history of recurrent sinus infections as part of her 
her problems. Mold, Klebsiella, Mycoplasma, Strep, you know, I skipped some. Uh, these are some molds. And just know that if you don't have IgG reactivity to mold, it does not mean that you don't have a mold problem. It, it, it doesn't mean that at all. It's like if you don't have immune reactivity to mercury, it does not mean that you don't have a mercury problem. You could still have a mercury problem. And, but when you get that immune uh, recognition by it, then it gets really problematic and really, really bad. Because every time you're exposed to it, your immune system is like just, just going haywire. Um, and then, you know, the last two on here, cytomegalovirus. So we've seen that on the last slide. There's EBV up there. And then Borrelia, which is Lyme. What you can't see on the second page of this test is the Lyme co-infections. Um, and this person was in range or normal with the Lyme co-infections. So this is one way to kind of cast a broad net and just see, okay, I think you're dealing with some kind of bugs. Let's figure out what they are so we have a pretty good idea of what we're aiming at. Um, so that's some of the testing. Now, the next thing that I want to get into is, is really the immunology of this. Because now that I've explained you know, some of the definitions, getting into the immunology of this is really going to explain some of the solutions uh, because they're designed to alter this Im immunology and strengthen your defenses and you know, er eradicate infections and pathogens when you understand the immunology. So the thing we're going to look at are these things called T cells, okay? And so in your adaptive immune system, and, you know, if you're a patient, if you're, you know, somebody who this is like, you know, speaking Chinese to, it, it really doesn't matter. What you need to remember is that these T cells can become different types of T cells, and they're going to serve different purposes in your immune system. So this guy in the middle that's a naive T cell, let's say that that is like a young kid, boy or girl, that wants to be a soldier when they grow up. And you're like, okay, great, kid. You can be a soldier. You can be uh, an army. You can be in the Navy. You can be in the Air Force. Or you can be in the Marines. Which one are you thinking? And they're like, I'm really into the water. I think I'm going to be in the, in the Navy. Or I really love planes. I think I'm going to be in the Air Force. And you kind of get the point here. So the first thing that they can become is Th1. And Th1, as you see up here, fights intracellular pathogens. So that's your EBV, that's your CMV, that's your Lyme, that's everything that we just talked about. The intracellular infections are fought with the Th1 side of things. Th2, right below it, they fight things like extracellular parasites. So anytime that you have a parasite, it causes more of these kids to become this type of military branch. Let's say these parasites are kind of like, uh, you know, um, uh, something attacking us by sea. So all of these young kids, they all want to be soldiers. They're all becoming Navy men and women, and none of them are becoming Air Force men or women. So that leaves us more susceptible to an airborne attack because all of our defenses are going to the sea. We're putting all our eggs in that basket, and so it's leaving us susceptible to an airborne attack. Now, over here, they can also become something called Th17, which is bad. It's the worst of all of these. It drives a lot of tissue-damaging inflammation, and especially in autoimmunity, Th17 drives a lot of autoimmunity. So if you have you know, Hashimoto's, TH17 is driving that immune destruction of the thyroid gland. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, TH17 is often driving that destruction of the joint space. If you have MS, TH17 is often driving the destruction of that myelin or neurological tissue. So TH17 is, is the worst one. And there are some, some nuances to this. Like when you encourage more TH1, it discourages TH2. So you want more people coming over here to the Air Force so that they don't become this, uh, which can be really bad. And then the last one 
is, is the T regs or the regulatory T cells. And those are really good. Those dampen autoimmunity, those dampen the immune response. So you don't, these are maybe like the Peace Corps, let's say. But let's say we have an active war going on. You know, an enemy is attacking us. They're maybe attacking us by air. They're maybe attacking us by sea. We don't want all our little kids becoming Peace Corps members in that instance, right? And obviously nothing against Peace Corps. But we need soldiers. We need soldiers. We don't want things to come in and dampen our immune response. So we don't want things to become Tregs unless things are balanced. Once that immune system is balanced, Th1 and 2 and 17, once it's balanced, then we want Tregs because they maintain the balance. They maintain the peace. They're kind of like the peacemakers. But if there's an active skirmish, we don't want peacemakers. We want to get this skirmish solved and then bring peace. So I hope that makes sense. But this is really what I've been studying for the last year or so, and it's, it's really, really important. So these Th2, once again, this is going to be symptoms like uh, or, or allergies, asthma, and this is also our overgrowth. And we're going to get to that in a second, I guess. So the, your naive T-cells, these are like the little kids. They can become whatever they want to be. And let's say it's, let's, let's change this. Let's say they can become uh, Air Force. They can become Navy. They can become Peace Corps, or they can become criminals, right? And if they become criminals, they cause a lot of damage. We don't want anybody to become criminals. We would love it if they're in the Peace Corps. We would love it if they're in the Air Force. We would love it if they're in the Navy. We just don't want them to become criminals. So TH1, once again, it fights intracellular pathogens. It kills bacteria and viruses. It's low in chronic infection. It's what caused the chronic infection. It's low in autoimmunity, and that allows that Th17 uh, to, to grow more. Th2, the other side of the teeter-totter, it'll fight parasites, but it will also expel pathogens from hollow spaces. So going back to our, our framework that we built before, if we have uh, overgrowth in hollow spaces, which immune system do you think is going to be more stimulated? It's the Th2 side of things. So the overgrowths are going to lead to more of a Th2 response. Now, as it leads to, let's say here's the even teeter-totter, as it leads to more Th2, more Th2, more Th2, what's happening to Th1 over here? It's coming down. So that leads to more Epstein-Barr, more Lyme, more uh, herpes, more cold sores, more uh, sinus infections, more et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because this immune system is tipping, tipping, and tipping. That is the vicious cycle. As Th2, as you have more and more Th2, some of the cytokines or the chemicals that Th2 cells release they tell these little kids, so more TH2, this is like all the, all the Navy people being like, hey, we're going to go out to the schools and we're going to tell all the little kids how great it is to be in the Navy. We need more Navy. We want more Navy. So then more become Navy, less become Air Force. And then it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. And that is the vicious cycle of how over the years, more and more and more and more and more and more infection leads to more of this, more GI inflammation, sinus inflammation, more sinus inflammation leads to more infection. And like the teeter-totter starts out just a little tipped and then it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. More Th2 leads to less Th1, leads to more Th17, leads to more Th2, leads to less Th1, leads to more infection, you know, so on and so forth, leads to more tissue destruction, leads to more symptoms, leads to worse allergies, worse asthma, worse sinus stuff, year in, year out, more food sensitivities, more GI inflammation, and it is a vicious cycle. Um, and Th17, you know, we mentioned that it fights extracellular bacteria and fungi like mold. Um, and is very inflammatory and creates a lot of tissue destruction. Th17 is the driver of autoimmune inflammation, and more Th1 helps shut down Th17. So the goals, from a clinical standpoint, the goals are like, okay, first off, 
We got all these bad guys. How do we shut them down? We got to block the inflammation that these guys have created. That's our most urgent thing. Then we need to balance out our defenses, right? We need to increase TH1, we need to decrease TH2. So first thing we do is we want to repair the damage. Then we want to bring in more defenses to make sure it doesn't happen again. Then we want to bring in the peacemakers last. And these are a lot of the strategies that we're working with our patients. If there's an appropriate order in which to do things, um, and so we've got to stop inflammation. We've got to rebalance the immune system in an appropriate order. So what can you do, right? What can you do? What can you do? What can you do? So potential solutions. Well, it kind of depends. I mean, going back to the labs, going back to your symptoms, going back to your history, do you personally, do you need to kill off overgrowths? I don't know, but you know, you may. Do you need to decrease your pathogen burden? Do you just have a high burden of these viruses? Maybe instead of 380 trillion, you got 390 trillion. I don't know. It's pure speculation, of course. But maybe you have more viruses because your immune system has been down and it's allowed you know, your 380 to grow, grow to 390. Do we need to balance or strengthen the immune system? Yes. Um, do we need to, in, within that, do we need to increase TH1? Do we need to decrease inflammation? Do we need to decrease TH2? Do we need to put this side of the teeter-totter down? Or do we just need to push this side of the teeter-totter up? Or do we need to do a little bit of both? Do we need to kill any extracellular bacteria to try to get that TH17 to turn off? While also detoxifying, controlling blood sugar, retraining your brain and your limbic system and your sympathetics and parasympathetics and managing inflammation. Do we need to do all those things? Yes, 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 yes to all of the above. But each case is obviously very different. So in some people, our priority is going to be more like, hey, we need to kill off this candida overgrowth that you have. And then we need to balance the immune system. In others, it's like, hey, you get too many infections. We need to boost your immune system and try to to you know, stop this infectious process. We need to remove these parasites because we're never gonna be able to rebalance the immune system if you have parasites. That's why it's very, very customized. So what are the solutions? I'm gonna skim through some of these, but we're going through diet, we're going through supplements, we're going through herbs, we're going through like what, you know, what can you do? So for gut overgrowth. So this is things like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, CIFO, Candida, or just generalized dysbiosis um, anywhere in the gut tract. So there, there's different diet strategies. So like with SIBO, there's, there's a, a lot that you can do diet-wise. It's really, really tricky. But like FODMAPs, which is uh, fermentable, oligosaccharide, disaccharide, monosaccharides, and polyols. So it's avoiding these certain foods that these bacteria that have overgrown in the gut they can, they can ferment, and when they ferment, then they produce a lot of gas and a lot of bloating. So you're trying to starve off this overgrowth. I would say that that's kind of akin to, like, um, you know, if you could, like, starve the, the weeds in your garden, if you, like, blocked them off from the sunlight, you're going to starve those off. Now, unfortunately, it's going to kill everything else, too. So maybe if you can block off like a, an area of the garden, so just the bad stuff's going to be starved off, you're starving them of, it, of their fuel. Um, so FODMAPs, fibers, starches, sugars, things that these bacteria can feed on and grow on. If it's candida, you know, candida feeds on sugar. It feeds on carbs. So a candida killing diet is typically a low carb, low sugar diet. You can also eat antifungal foods and foods that are going to help your body kill the fungus. But from a diet perspective, especially with these infections and overgrowth, I would say that your diet is not going to fix this. But it's an important part, and it's the first part that we work with with everybody is get them on the right meal plan for what they're dealing with. But that's, the, that's like first grade. It's like you can't, you can't be in eighth grade if you haven't passed first grade. You can't be in fifth grade if you haven't passed first grade. You can't do anything school-wise if you haven't passed first grade. And that's how the diet is. So, so a lot of times we're starving these foods with the overgrowth. But then there are supplements, and these are gut overgrowths again. So your food is you know, obviously really important to that. But so what are some supplements that you can take? Well, there are individual herbs. 
things like cat's claw, things like powder arco bark, uva ursi, uh, different herbs, different barks, um, caprylic acid and mono lorne, both of which are found in coconut oil. So there's good, you know, antifungal, antibacterial properties of coconut oil. Grape seed extract, olive leaf extract, there's all these different things, there's a zillion of them. If you type in like antifungal essential oils, it's almost all of them. If you type in antifungal herbs, it's almost all of them. So herbs, essential oils, uh, we call this God's pharmacy. There's tons and tons of natural things. And sometimes it's just looking for you know, the right combo. So we'll use a lot of blends, like biocyne, biocyne being one of our favorites. Um, and for a gut overgrowth, for a gut overgrowth for this conversation, I would use the biocyte in drops um, or maybe the biocyte in capsules, but I usually use the biocyte in drops. Now I say that because if it were lime, which we're going to get to in a sec, but I would use the liposomal biocyte because it doesn't just stay in the gut, it crosses through the membrane and goes systemically throughout the whole body. If we're talking like uh, vagina, uh, yeast infections, va vaginal uh, bacterial infections, we'll use the capsule as a vaginal suppository. So different applications of biocide. And if you're not familiar with biocide, you know, look it up. Uh, I had somebody recently look it up and they said, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe all the stuff that that does that that's good for. I think I just need to take that every day. And I'm like, well, yeah, you probably do. But it's something that we use as a tool in our tool belt. It's like if somebody's never seen a drill, then all of a sudden in their carpenter, they're like, oh my gosh, this drill. I could do so much with it. I could do everything. I could build this whole house. But you really, you can't, but it is an important tool. Then we use different blends like uh, yeast anil is a product from Apex Energetics. Fung DX is a product from Systemic Formulas. So we use different blends because a lot of these companies, they've studied all the different herbs and oils and vitamins and things that are good for this, and they put it into a synergistic blend. Um, then also probiotics. So not just killing off the bad stuff, but increasing the good stuff too. So um, soil-based probiotics are really, really great. High-potency, high-strain probiotics are really, really good to kind of outnumber these bad guys um, and make sure that there are, you know, taking over the terrain. For other overgrowths, you know, we mentioned that they could be in other places. The sinuses are a really, really common one. So maybe it's like a neti pot. Um, I use a neti pot every single morning with three drops of frankincense, one drop of peppermint oil every single morning. And sometimes I switch it up, thyme oil, uh, tea tree oil. Um, I've recently been putting some biomolecular oxygen in there to try it out. So neti pot is a great way to get things up through there. You could also use a lot of sinus sprays that have herbal preparations, different things designed to keep these overgrowths at bay. You could also nebulize uh, things like essential oils. There's a lot of stuff that you can nebulize to just get up into that area, oral or um, sinuses. Um, tea tree, frankincense, thyme. You could put biocide in a neti pot. I've done that before. Sinus defense is a great product from... Uh, EC3 from Dr. Don Dennis, um, and then like I mentioned, the biocide and the vaginal suppositories, depending on where the overgrowth is. A huge one for this is get rid of mold. Easier said than done. Watch our other videos. If you are in a moldy environment, you're never going to fix any of this. You're never going to fix any of this. You're never going to fix anything, really. Um, you're never going to fix lime if you still have mold. You're never going to fix candida if you still have mold. You're never going to fix brain fog. You're never going to fix any symptom if there's still mold in the environment. So those are things, we've got other videos like I mentioned, but things like glutathione, things like binders, things like the sauna to try to get that mold out of your body. You have to get rid of the fungus, but you have to detoxify the mycotoxins. And that's an important concept is the mold could be gone. Even from your house, the mold could be gone. The fungus, the colonies could be gone, but the mycotoxins that they produce are still on your clothes, on your books, on your walls, in your carpet, and they're still in your body too. And, and that's not more of a killing thing, that's a toxin, it's a biotoxin. So you have to increase your detoxification, you have to increase detox pathways to make sure that those mycotoxins are being cleared out. 
So then we also have parasites next. Uh, so, you know, once again, there are, there are foods that are anti-parasitic. Well, if you look up the herbs that are anti-parasitic, if you look up the essential oils, there, there's a lot of them. So this is certainly not an all-inclusive list. Um, but foods like cinnamon, garlic, coconut oil, herbs like some of the more famous ones are things like black walnut, wormwood. Um, those are in a lot of different parasite things. And then also binders can help with parasites. So things like diatomaceous earth, charcoal, activated charcoal carbons, humic and fulvic acids, really, really helpful. And then a newer one is called the mimosa pudica seed. And this has just, you know, been made famous in the last couple of years by uh, Dr. Todd Watts um, in, in microbe formulas and cell core biosciences. And, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating thing that we're starting to use here in the clinic. Uh, I've got a four-year-old on, on a parasite cleanse right now. I've got multiple patients doing different parasite cleanses, something that I'm uh, doing as well. So the mimosa pudica seed. Now, the seed is an important part because... Um, Mimosa pudica, there are the flower and there's also the whole plant that some products use, but it's the seed that really does the trick. Um, and then here are some supplements. So there are, other, there are others that we use, like Apex has one called paracetanil. Um, Biocidin is good for parasites, but this is what we've been doing lately. It's more of these specific parasite cleanses with these products like Para-1, which is Mimosa pudica, Para-2, and para three, and all of these have different, they go in a pretty specific order because with the parasites, it's easier to clear out certain types of parasites first and then go for the deeper ones. Like some of the parasites, like Astrangeloides, uh, can dig into the muscle, can burrow into the muscle. And that's not really the first priority. The first priority is getting some of the low hanging fruit, getting some of the easy to clean ones, maybe some of the flukes, some of the worms, some things like that. Um, in para one, para two, para three. And then I put on their full moon just to remind myself to talk about that parasites like to come out around the full moon. So there are a lot of protocols. There are a lot of, um, I guess protocols that base parasite cleanses around the full moon. So during the full moon, you can kind of hit a parasite cleanse a little bit harder um, and that's just a really, really interesting thing, an interesting concept that these parasites are more active around the full moon. And if that sounds crazy to you, then I don't know what to tell you because just think about, you know, this moon, the moon controls the freaking tides of the ocean. You don't think that it can control things in our bodies and that there's different, you know, gravitational forces and things that we're not quite familiar with. Um, it's absolutely uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt a, a fact. So sometimes facts sound weird when it's the first time you've heard them. Um, but then, so those are some things for parasites, overgrowths. Here's some things to decrease the TH2 response. So if this side of the teeter totters high, you got to dampen it. So first off, you have to kill overgrowths. We already talked about that. You have to heal the inflamed mucosal tissue. So let's say that you had a candida overgrowth for the last five years and it's caused all these GI issues. Well, there's inflammation. And so just because we've killed the candida doesn't mean we've repaired the damage. And this, the, the damage from the inflammation in hollow spaces will continue to drive that TH2 loop. So you've got to go in first and kill the overgrowths. Then you've got to go in and do some repair. So these are things like L-glutamine, the number one fuel source for your gut lining, for your epithelial cells, things like aloe vera um, is a common, common one. Marshmallow is common. A glutathione is in here a lot of times, but things that are going to straight up heal the gut lining, the sinus lining, etc. So you've got to do that first. You've got to remove parasites, but then how can you turn off the TH2 response? Well, one of the biggest things that does it is uh, an herb called perilla, perilla extract. And so perilla will block interleukin-4, which I'm not going to go back, but if you see that naive T-cell, in the presence of interleukin-4, it makes it want to become Th2, and then the Th2s release interleukin-4, so that's part of that vicious cycle. 
Perilla is one of the things that, that helps with that. And I, quite frankly, have had amazing results with this product. Personally, I have chronic sinus issues um, that I feel like, you know, knock on wood, have been doing the best that they've done in years since I added this supplement. So really, really cool. There's also things in there like N-acetylcysteine, astragalus, um, some things to decrease the TH2 response and just bring balance to that immune teeter-totter. So, and then there's the viruses, the TH1 side of things more. So, diet for the viruses. Well, one of the things that, that you can do, and I don't think that this is going to fix your viral load of, by any means, but it's something else that you can do and add in, is a high lysine, low arginine diet. And there's a ton of info out there. There's foods lists. There's... Uh, you know, there's just a, a lot of information about how to do this, but looking for foods that are low in arginine because that helps starve these viruses and things that are high in lysine is just really, really helpful. Um, and if you're already taking a product, you're already taking a supplement, you know you have a high viral load, then, then you might as well do the dietary part with it because anything that you can do to kind of help and stack the scale in your favor uh, is going to potentially, you know, be be helpful. It's often not one thing that's a solution. It's a combo of things. So absolutely, the viral diet is important. There are lots of herbs like clove, ginger, echinacea, olive leaf extract. Once again, if you look up the herbs that kill viruses, it's almost all of them. It's like everything you've ever heard of, and, and the same with the essential oils. There are a ton. So frankincense, really, really good healer tea tree oil or melaleuca oil, clove oil, uh, melissa oil, uh, oregano oil, oil of oregano. All, all those different things are really, really great for viral infections because they have antiviral properties to them. In the supplement world, there are things that have single ingredients like vitamin C. Like we've all probably heard that you know, take vitamin C if you're getting a sniffle, take vitamin C if you're starting to get a cold. And high-dose vitamin C especially has been shown uh, to fight viruses and to, to halt viral replication and things like that. So as lysine can be taken as an individual ingredient, single ingredient product. Uh, echinacea has antiviral properties. Not only boosts TH1 immune system, but it actually kills viruses when the viruses are exposed to it in you know, petri dishes. Zinc. Uh, very famous right now for antiviral replication properties. Glutathione, very helpful for halting viral replication or killing viruses. But then there's also, once again, these blends, and that's what I use more often, is a blend from a company like Apex. Their product is called x Or, um, surprise, I didn't put it on here, but uh, Pure Encapsulations is called TH1 Support. And a lot of times I like to use those two products together because they have different ingredients. The, the x Vironment is more like echinacea um, and a couple other things. And the, the pure encapsulation one is like, um, I want to say astragalus and some other TH1 boosters, maybe some arabinogalactans or reishi mushroom extracts or something like that. Um, but different blends from these most reputable companies have a good quality blend. So orthomoleculars, there's this called Virusid. Uh, systemic formulas. There's is called VV. Um, or, you know, these humates and fulvates, these humic acids and fulvic acids can also help with viruses and help get rid of viral fragments and viral particles and help detoxify uh, the body from, from viruses. Uh, really, really helpful. And then things like we mentioned to boost TH1. Oh yeah, that's what's in uh, this, the pure encapsulation of the berberine, there's astragalus. I think there might be Chinese skull cap in that one. There are things like arabinogalactan. So sometimes if I feel that somebody has a lot of TH2 dominance, maybe they have allergies, asthma, they have these overgrowths, might have them take a product like a biocidin, let's say, to kill off the overgrowth, 
then I might give them a probiotic that has arabinogalactans in it so that at the same time, we're giving them a probiotic that can help with the overgrowth, but it also has something that helps increase that Th1 immune system inside their gut. So there's a lot, a lot of ways to do this and a lot of different, you know, tricks and tools that, that I've learned over the years and that, you know, a skilled practitioner uh, will be able to help you with. So echinacea, astragalus, sulf sulforaphane is another big one. So that's from broccoli sprouts. Um, the cheapest and easiest way is to grow your own broccoli sprouts and just eat a bunch of them. They're really cheap, really easy to grow, but really, really powerful for boosting sulforaphane, which can also boost something called the NRF2 pathway and glutathione and all these good things with sulforaphane. Reishi mushroom and different mushroom extracts um, can be Th1 boosters. Berberine, Chinese skullcap, the galactans, um, and glutathione are great for viruses. And I guess this is, we're just talking about viruses right now, but boosting the Th1 can also help with the bacteria too. But some of these things that we talked about with the lysine and with the zinc, they're more on the viral side of the Th1 uh, uh, sides. Here's the bacterial stuff. But once again, it's a lot of the same stuff. It's a lot of these herbs like olive leaf, oregano, St. John's wort, powdarco bark. Um, you know, throw in like any essential oil and it probably is pretty good for bacterial infections. Um, essential oils like clove, tea tree, frankincense, peppermint, and blends like biocidin and boosting the Th1 immune system. But, so, that is everything in a nutshell. Now let me recap before we just finish here because that was a lot of stuff to go over. But what happened? So, who knows what started it? Maybe it's a bad diet, bad blood sugar control. Maybe you got an infection, you went on an antibiotic, and maybe uh, it's a lot of stress, you know. All these things, life, can lead to these problems. So let's say that maybe first you get um, an infection. Because of that infection, you go on an antibiotic. Because of that antibiotic, you get a candida overgrowth. And so now this candida is starting to overgrow. And maybe it's just a little bit at first. But then a year later, and it, you keep feeding it with sugar, you keep having stressful lifestyle, you keep being exposed to toxins, and this overgrowth takes over. And so it's boosting the Th1, or excuse me, it's boosting the Th2 side of the immune system. So you are starting to all of a sudden get more allergies, more asthma, more food sensitivities, more GI symptoms, more sinus symptoms because of this overgrowth. Whereas on the other side of the teeter-totter, because it's boosting Th2, it's lowering Th1. So you're getting more viral replication, you're getting more infection, you're getting more Lyme disease, you're getting more staph or strep or whatever the case may be. Because over here, you're getting more and more of this, and over here, you're getting more and more of this. And as that continues, it just gets more and more and more and more. So more infection leads to more inflammation and overgrowth. More overgrowth and inflammation in hollow spaces leads to more infection. And it will just keep going and going and going. And it can turn on Th17. It can lead to an autoimmune process. It can lead to basically any symptom under the sun. It can lead to any diagnoses under the sun because it's thrown off the immune system so much. Th1 is important for cancer surveillance, all these different things that throw off the immune system. And so when you understand this picture, when you understand this whole concept, you start to understand that it can kind of explain a lot and a lot of symptoms. Is that somebody comes in with Lyme, well, right away, what do I know? Well, we need to boost their Th1 side of the immune system so they can fight Lyme. If they have Lyme and allergies, we might have to decrease the Th2 side of things. If they have Candida, and maybe their symptoms don't match up with either side, but maybe we do a lab test and they have Candida. Well, we know we need to decrease that Th2 side. We know we need to increase that Th1 side. We also know we need to bring balance. We know we need to decrease inflammation. So all, and then we also have to look upstream for what, what caused it in the first place. But like I said, it's a very, very complicated puzzle. There are a lot of moving pieces to this. But if you zoom out, 
from a 30,000 foot view, you can kind of see how these chronic problems run together, how one leads to the other, leads to the other, leads to the other, and trying to ask, you know, which one came first is kind of like asking which came first, the chicken or the egg. Well, it does not matter. We know we need to dampen this side. We know we need to increase this side. We know we need to look at all the lifestyle factors, blood sugar, stress, sleep, um, diet, you know, all the lifestyle factors that can cause this. Because if we, if we remove some of the causes and as we balance out the teeter-totter, then we can become symptomatic or symptom free or move into a state of what's called remission if it's autoimmune condition or just get to the point where all of a sudden our brain fog is gone, our GI symptoms are gone, our allergies have improved, our asthma goes away, our food sensitivities have improved, our sinusitis has gone away when we look at things from a big picture perspective. So what I like to do is I like to take the big picture I like to zoom in to the finest of details. We haven't even gotten into any of the fine, fine details of any of this stuff. But then zoom back out and say, okay, where does this leave us? What can you do? So this is a heavy presentation. There's a lot of information going into it. I think it's one of the most important concepts in all of functional medicine is to understand this Th1, Th2, Th17 immune system, to understand these infections, to understand these overgrowths, to understand viral reactivations. I think it's a huge, huge thing. A lot of our patients are going to get a lot of value out of this. Hopefully it wasn't too much to digest and hopefully you got something out of it. If you did and you are on YouTube, leave us a comment, give us a like, subscribe to our channel. We really, really appreciate that. Let us know if we're doing a good job and stay tuned next time.